deep within the Segmentum Pacificus to the galactic west of Holy Terra, an event known as the War of the False Primarch saw the 33rd millennium plunged into war. Little is known about the true events of this conflict, being a minor footnote in Games Workshop's expansive history of the Warhammer 40k universe, but not all has been lost to the ravages of time and censure. While the identity of the False Primarch is unknown, they succeeded in rousing chaos and rebellion in the Sector, biting back against the hand of the Greater Imperium. The High Lords of Terra saw fit to task the Adeptus Astartes in the suppression of the False Primarch and inducted five Space Marine chapters into a holy fraternity dubbed the Pentarchy of Blood. The Carcharodons, the Flesh Eaters, the Red Talons, the Death Eagles, and the Charnel Guard saw to the sector running red with traitor blood over the next 80 years, eventually leading to the False Primarchs slain and their name purged from history itself. In this video series, I'll be going into the five chapters of the Pentarchy of Blood, some being more famous in the eyes of the fandom, and some a little more obscure. In this video, we'll be looking at the most secretive of the Pentarchy, the Death Eagles. The Death Eagles are another ancient and venerable chapter of Space Marines in the history of Warhammer 40k, dating all the way back to the times of Rogue Trader. However, unlike their previously perceived Pentarchy partners, they were not featured in the pages of the original Rogue Trader rulebook. Instead, they made their first appearance in White Dwarf number 123 in the year 1990, three whole years before the inception of 2nd edition 40k in 1993. While many of the Rogue Trader chapters do see a modern popularity, with expanded lore, with novels, and sometimes exclusive models, the Death Eagles are a rare army to see these days. Compared to the pages upon pages of lore that other Pentarchy chapters have to their name, the Death Eagles are surprisingly scant in this department, being on the lesser side of the amount of concrete lore that Games Workshop has written for them. Before we talk about their lore though, we need to talk about the Death Eagles' biggest discrepancy, their uniform. Shown on screen here is the modern Death Eagle uniform. The classic black power armor is accented with white pauldron fields and a bone-colored helmet. This is the uniform that the Death Eagles have been wearing since 2004, featured in the book How to Paint Space Marines. Normally I just use a brush, but whatever suits your fancy, I guess. Anyways, the Death Eagles original uniform scheme from White Dwarf 123 was, uh, like, it's not quite halved, but it's like, it's not quartered either. It's like, it's a combination of halved and alternating between white and a pinkish purple with a gold to accent it all. Now I know what you're thinking, why would they change away from such an eye-catching uniform to something so boring, so modern, so generic? However, as many things in the Warhammer 40k universe, there may be more to this under the surface than initially believed, or perceived. Whichever one of those words works better in the script, just, just cut the other one out. And cut this out too. 10,000 years ago, the galaxy was plunged into war by the infamous John Heresy. As the Astartes legions were picking allegiances, it was not uncommon for loyalist forces originating from traitor legions to continue fighting in the Emperor's name. The Death Eagles are rumored to be descendants from one such loyalist force who broke away from their parent legion, the Emperor's Children. Refusing to give up their legion's color and heraldry, the ancient Astartes must have logically saw the bitter fighting of the heresy to the end, surviving one of the most apocalyptic wars in human history, and later reorganized into their own chapter in an unknown founding. However, in the grim darkness of the far future, the Phoenician and his kin are villainized as murderous, lecherous traitors, maybe rightfully so as the poster boys of hentai marines. And you two motherfuckers need Jesus. Regardless, to claim such a heritage would be unthinkable in the modern era, much less be boastful to such a claim, so it is theorized that the current Death Eagles may have taken the black at some point in their history in order to hide their traitorous lineage. The waters are muddied even further on top of this, as many now suspect their genetic lineage to originate from the bird-adjacent Raven Guard Legion, yet no concrete answers can be confirmed by any suspicious party. 
While this is an in-universe take on the uniform change between their inception in 1990 and their updated scheme debuting in 2004, in a more meta sense there are some other theories that could explain it all as well. Some people think the original colors are silly, and the scheme may have been updated to match the grim darkness of 4th edition in 2004, while others may believe that Games Workshop simply named two chapters the same thing and blended their lore together. Honestly, for Games Workshop, that's pretty fucking on brand, but the truth of it will probably never be confirmed, leaving the original scheme and the revised scheme two sides of the same coin. Personally, I kind of like the idea of mixing both uniforms into an army, maybe the standard Battle Brother getting the eccentric uniform, and all black being reserved for some sort of specialist squad, or the other way around, you know, whatever. Regardless of what color the Death Eagles don, their work as loyalist forces continues into the modern era, although their list of known engagements is small. Honestly, being a member of the Pentarchy of Blood is probably where most people know the Death Eagles, and uh, it usually stops there. But, but hey, they, they, they do other stuff too. As previously mentioned in the Carcharodons video, the Death Eagles collaborated with other Astartes in the Solar Rebellions. Within the Segmentum Solar, Chaos Uprisings began to surge, the fires of war fanned by the Iron Warriors, Night Lords, and World Eaters Traitor Legions. The Adeptus Astartes were called to suppress the Rebellion, the Loyalist forces consisting of the Death Eagles, the Carcharodons, the Angels of Absolution, and everyone's favorite inquisitorial lapdog, the Minotaurs. While the corruption was successfully expunged, records of these events are inconsistent in terms of deployed manpower and timelines, possibly suggesting some meddling from a certain chapter, but probably not, but you know, maybe, you know, not a lot, just, just a little, as a treat. The Death Eagles are also known for their efforts in the reconquest of the Forsar sector of the Segmentum Tempestus. A portion of the Forsar sector and its hive world capital of, oh, alright, same name, got it was overrun by the Wa of Warboss Garagak. Side note, but I know everyone reads Wa as but I always read it as <laughs> Anyways, the Death Eagles are inducted into a reclamation force consisting of two fellow Space Marine chapters, the Aurora chapter and the Revilers, as well as the Imperial Guard and a handful of Titans, and successfully reclaim the sector for the Emperor. It's noted that the Raven Guard's homeworld of Deliverance is located within the Forsar sector. With the Revilers also being sons of Korax, it makes me wonder if the Death Eagles joined the Reclamation Force to possibly bolster their false heritage as fellow Raven Guard successors. Like, hey, how do you do, fellow bird bros? With how vague the lore surrounding the Death Eagles is, it's certainly a possibility. And personally, I think it's pretty cool to have that layer of uncertainty, uh, an ambiguosity, if you will. Uh, Spellcheck says that's not a word, but I don't play by the rules here. When looking at the Death Eagles on Google, this picture frequently comes up. I really like the neutral pose of the left mini, and I wanted to emulate it on mine. Not recreate it one to one, but kind of a mirror, a mini to invoke the sassiness of this venerable relic. I got my hands on this recast of Lieutenant Amulius. This was a limited edition model from a 2019 event, I think, but as a nice neutral pose that I wanted to use. Side note, but some people have asked me where I get my recasts from, and uh, that's a good question, honestly. I have a friend, let's call him Shady. Despite the alias that I've chosen for him, he's very reliable, and I've known him for years. He's in direct contact with a recaster, and I buy through him to help keep his operation safe. So I tell him what I want, he and my minis show up a month later. I, I, <laughs> I understand why they want to keep it on the DL, and honestly the whole operation is kind of fun. Regardless, it does end up a very reliable way of getting these minis that are either out of print, rare, or being scalped on eBay. Anyways, with my block of Chinesium, possibly Russianite copy of Amulius in hand, I take to chopping off the right arm holding his helmet. I would have preferred to save this arm as it's a unique bit, but thinking about it, I don't really like bare heads, so what use would I have with this arm, you know? Either way, some clippers, sanding, and scraping got the area clear. I use super glue to press the two halves of the body together and glue it to the base. 
The base was pressed into place on the... Man, that's a, that's a hard sentence. The base was pressed into place on the base with poster tack, since I wanted to put the mini on a 32mm base later, and I'll have to chop it up to get the mini off. Frustratingly, the mini's feet are molded onto the scenic base. Uh, there's probably a reason for it, but at the end of the day, damn, that's annoying. One thing I wanted to try with this mini was removing the bulbs on the side of the Mark 10 angles. I'm not really going to go too much into that process though, since it was kind of a side experiment, and I don't really think it was worth the trouble. Essentially, it was just chopping them off and filling the spaces with milliput, trying to match the angles of the armor, and sanding it all smooth. It could be better though, I kind of think I need to rethink my approach on the ordeal, but as I previously said, I don't know how worth it this would be, you know? Anyways, I turned my attention to the right arm, and for this I once again dip into my large supply of Assault Intercessor arms. The pose on the reference mini had this bald fist, but those are kind of hard to come by for right hands, so despite what I show off here, I do end up using another one of my beloved open right hand bits from the mono pose Assault Intercessor. I'm, uh, I'm getting low on these, and I'm, I'm starting to freak out. <laughs> For the left arm, I dip into the Intercessor's kit for this resting bolt rifle arm, which had the pauldron trimmed off and attached at an angle that invokes that reference pose I've been following. Overall, an easy conversion that just needed to be cut off of its scenic base since, as previously mentioned, the feet were annoyingly sculpted into the base. Also, I wanted a very specific left pauldron to invoke the same energy as the pose reference, but I didn't have it anymore. Thinking about it, I used it on the Red Wing video, but I was just very hell-bent on using that pauldron in particular, uh, so I ended up ordering one off of eBay. I could have just set up a 3D printer and printed up something pretty close, but I didn't feel like it, and I wanted to get my hands on some bits for later videos, so may as well just knock it all out at once, you know? So we've come to a crossroads now. Classic white and purple, or the updated black, white, and bone? Well, let's think about it. There are pros and cons to each side, so we'll go ahead and list them out. Uh, one is rad as fuck, and one means painting more black armor. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't do it, bros. We're going old school. Plus, look at it, man. Come on. Have fun for once in your life, you dusty old hag. That being said, before we actually get into that painting, we need to quickly analyze these reference pictures. As you can see from the surviving material from the time, the actual color distribution follows the same overarching idea, but differs in a few ways. For example, this marine's right leg is purple, or magenta, really, it's, it's, it's magenta, while on the pose reference, it's white. Looking further up, you can see that the helmets are bisected differently as well. Even the power pack has a variation, as this marine has a silver power pack, while the 9 pixels over the shoulder of the pose reference shows a magenta power pack, which could possibly be half white as well, but we'll never know. Now there are multiple reasons why this could be this way, either the less rigid structure of the studio painting standards back then, or honestly just a simple mistake, but looking at the minis, the easiest and most probable explanation is simply each armor mark being different and having different areas to paint. After all, the only part of the model that matches on both are the right feet. So if you start from the right foot and begin your pattern going up from there, you do end up having to distribute the colors differently. I did mine a bit differently though, as I didn't notice the right foot pattern until I started painting, and I kind of wanted my helmet to match the pose references helmet. I did want to plan out my painting steps though, so I did end up taking a picture of the model and I threw it into GIMP, the art kind, not the sex kind, and colored the model on a layer with 50% opacity. Since I wanted my helmet a particular way, I started from the helmet and went down as opposed to starting from the right foot going up, and I was also much less granular with the arms, counting the entire arm as a single color zone. That part was mostly an error on my side though, since both minis show the pattern being respected over the elbow armor, and generally being much more granular over the arm than I was. Also, my pattern mainly respects the pose reference, 
but I did end up choosing to go with a silver power pack, mainly because it's much more visible than the other power pack, and I feel like it helped bring both of the reference minis together uh, on one mini, if that makes sense. <laughs> I just had one of those what am I doing with my life moments recording voiceovers about some fucking color patterns on 30 year old JPEGs at 6am what happened man <laughs> what, what, what happened the Death Eagle was primed white since there's no reason to really paint white if I can just spray it on now I'm not going to worry about Edge highlighting the white since I want to keep the fields of the armor as bright as possible so for now, I started base coating the purple, uh, or magenta. It's totally magenta. I don't know why the wiki says purple. It's magenta. Specifically this magenta. This Vallejo magenta is perfect right out of the bottle. Not Vallejo purple, magenta. I followed the scheme I worked out in GIMP, base coating magenta panels across the mini. I did run into some trouble around the collar, but I managed to work around the issue. Now it had been a while since I properly heavy metal highlighted a mini, and with my desire to keep the white very bright, I decided to go for it for here. It, uh, it did keep the white nice and untouched, but man, this was a very good reminder on why I dry brush like 99% of my models. It's just faster, man. Ugh. From here is the same old boring middle steps of base coating the holsters, guns, metallics, you know, all that. You know, the little gubbins that aren't fun to paint, but you just kind of gotta do. With all the dark gray laid out, I broke out that two thin coats, gold and silver, and base coated all of the metallic areas. If you can't tell, I'm in a total honeymoon phase with these paints. They, had, they just have such good coverage, and they're so smooth if you get them right. Duncan is truly the best girl. He just understands me. When it came to washing the mini, I was a bit more selective than I normally am. The black and silver areas got a black wash, and the white areas actually had me sit down and do a proper recess shade with a sharp brush. Compared to painting the rest of the mini, this took a very long time. But at the end of the day, can I say it was worth it? Uh, the white looks good, but no, I, I don't know. I wouldn't do this for my own army. Just no. Fuck it. With the black washing done, I hit the golds with a brown wash. There were some small bits like purity seals and a shoulder rope that got some red, and the eye lenses were painted a bright green, but my main concern was the base. I had debated a while on what kind of base to do, but, you know, we've come too far to bitch out, guys. Bam, bada, boom. Goblin green base. Well, not entirely goblin green. Just as the reference base is painted, there was a transitional period where the base tops were still a recognizable goblin green, but Games Workshop started painting the base rims tan. But hey, with the green and tan base combined with this nice little backdrop I made, I think this is a very nostalgic model in a sense. Maybe nostalgic is the wrong word. In 1990, I wasn't really alive, so I can't really be nostalgic for a time I was not present for, but, you know, it, it invokes the, the retro vibe. Also thinking about it, I think this is the first time I've painted a base rim that wasn't black on this channel. That's kind of, uh, kind of strange for me. But, hey, with all the colors, you know, being so bright and flashy, I just, I, I, it felt wrong not committing, you know, to the green and tan base. A black rimmed base and some nice, like, realistic looking grass on it. I don't know, it just, it would have looked strange to me. So, this one goes out to all you 50 year old dudes out there saying, Yeah, goblin green base. You keep up the good fight, you old, <laughs> you old bastards. Since the Red Talons video, we've had a new patron join the ranks. I'd like to thank Hosomi for their support. I am, a, uh, I am very broke in general, and every patron I get helps me not only in my personal life but here on the channel as well and I'm excruciatingly grateful for any kind of support that you guys show me so thank you very much if you guys are interested in supporting the channel I'd really like it if you gave the video a thumbs up or subscribed that uh, that truly means a lot to me or if you'd like to support me a little more you can find me over on Instagram or Patreon and with that that is four of the five of the 
Pentarchy members all done with, uh, I'd probably say the most anticipated, uh, no, 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 definitely, definitely the most anticipated chapter for the end. So I'll see you guys next week for the Charnel Guard. Thank you and have a good one.